Hey, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the another episode of Product Management Interview Experience. I am Sagat, and today we have Romil with us, who has recently cracked the product interview for Gartner. Welcome, Romil. Thank you, thank you, Sagat. Thank you for having me. Perfect. So, folks who are here for the first time, uh, I just wanted to introduce this channel to you. This is something where you can get to know how the interview. process happens for a product roles at various companies so do check out some previous videos and i hope you will find the right content that you're looking for so uh, yeah and today's episode we're going to be talking a lot about you know the entire interview process at gartner what were the various rounds how romil got uh, you know uh, landed up into this interview experience and would we'll get to know all his tips and tricks the way he tackled those so without any further ado let's get started so Romil, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Absolutely. Let me just bring up the slides as well. Just stay with me for a minute here. Um, and why I do that, uh, I think Sugat uh, can't say enough for the good work that you have been doing for the for the PM community. You know, it's. Um, I mean, I happen to actually sort of run by your channel while sort of snooping around trying to find product content, and I realized, hey man, I know this guy. And now there's a channel out of it, and I actually I think went ahead and watched every every one of them. To some extent, I think they also did contribute to, you know, my inputs and my journey in the interview process itself. Uh, because at the time I was sort of interviewing for a couple of uh, companies, but thank you so much for having me. All right, so I'll just start with a brief uh, introduction of myself. Uh, so my name is Ramel Joseph. I come with close to ten years of experience in product. uh although through varying roles so uh, back in the day i started off uh, as a system associate which now we know as a, as an engineer with microsoft one of their partner networks and uh, typical journey i think you 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 all, all of you guys would have heard this the story a lot from a lot of product managers right we started off as an engineer and then we realized that we want to do product management so this something similar happened with me as well um at that time you know we had people from from microsoft uh, who were from the business side who were coming in and then they were helping us with the requirements and i i started asking around who are these folks i i think i want to do that and not really do the back end coding that i'm doing not that i was too bad with it but just something i wanted to explore and uh, that's when i tapped into an opportunity with american express more on the customer service analysis side uh and that helped pave way to my first understanding of customer and customer pain points and customer problems although it wasn't for a specific product but it was general psychology of the customer i went on to sort of scale roles and uh, got into business continuity planning information security and disaster recovery that helped me understand product landscape in terms of digital products at a making express in the context of a making express and then i eventually made uh, the move into product management as a as a product owner and the product we were managing was basically for the us market uh through the online or through their mobile app giving every card member the ability to go ahead and raise an inquiry or a dispute on a particular transaction which primarily was based out based out of calls so they used to have to call american express go through an idea there was a whole 5 minute lag time and we actually brought it down to a couple of milliseconds all you need to do is just open up the app spend like 2 minutes 1 minute at max and you're done the same thing that you have been doing for for ages you know through calls so the flavor of that again at that time we never really knew product management there wasn't a product owner role product managers they weren't scrums and everything but in some shape or form we were doing product management and i eventually realized that i wanted to sort of understand the science a little bit more so I went on to get certified in scaled agile and that eventually then helped me tap into an opportunity with hitachi they had a newly acquired client and they were trying to do a lot of magic in this in the product space for the client because the client was new to agile themselves and they wanted a a product offering from hitachi so that has been the flavor of my my product um, journey so far and uh, i also sort of as time allows i also do actively engage in in mentoring so people who are wanting to transition into product probably people from the engineering side who just curious about what happens in product management and a lot of that also has contributed to my journey through the interview experience itself which i'll be speaking to so that's a little bit brief about me and what brings me to you all today great to have you romail and thanks a lot for walking through the entire uh, journey so far so i think the folks who are watching this and are curious to know so romail haven't 
uh, gone for any MBA, anything for, you know, transitioning into product management. He is uh, setting an example where he got an opportunity in the company and got an internal transition into product management. So while working in MX, I guess, Romel, you had that opportunity to pivot your career into product management and that's how you utilized it. Can you throw some more light absolutely. on that? Absolutely, absolutely. So it's it was one of those instances where, we, we, you know, you have to experience it to believe it. That's what I, that's what I feel, right? When, when you're working with different business units, you're, you're doing whatever is the kind of the nature of your role, right? You're into business analytics, you're into customer service uh, or what, what, that whole spectrum. All of those experiences actually contribute to your business acumen to some extent. And my school of thought at the time was, of course, I also had a phase where I was thinking, should I actually go get a formal education? And I might even, but my understanding or what broke the ice for me was, being able to tap into product opportunities, a product manager role, a senior product manager role, uh, not really having that formal business education because at the end of the day, you are getting that work-wise, right? You're getting that through your experiences. So I think it's primarily that transition actually happened when the business unit for which the role was, was a business unit I had worked with. So they were my stakeholders at one point in time. So for them, it was primarily around we need a person who understands the business, not necessarily who understands the semantics of business in general, which is what an MBA would teach you. So I think that's how I was able to uh, tap into that opportunity. And it was an so internal what, transition. Was it, there was an opportunity came up. Yeah. So was it easy? You had to convince your manager or it was straight, very straightforward uh, to deep dive into this journey? Uh, it was, uh, it was, I just getting into it, just that leg of a week to, from the time I interviewed internally to the time I got through, I think that was probably the easiest part. What was difficult was everything leading up to it. And I won't say difficult in the classic sense of there were a lot of hardships. I did not sleep at all and all of those things. It was primarily around building those things big, brick by brick, right? So this team that I, I, I started my journey in product, right? I was actively in conversation with them, you know, out of my curiosity to understand what is it that, you know, people do in product management. I eventually got myself a, a mentor or a guide, I would say, in the leader who was leading this particular team. And I think we used to meet once in two weeks of, of sort and just had general conversations. Hey, you know what, this is what's happening at my end. What's happening at your end? Okay, you did this. Tell me a little bit about that. So I started understanding product management through the lens of the director for product over there and eventually there came a time when there was an opportunity that he had. He had been having conversations with me. He has some, to some extent, seen my work as well. And he said, are you interested? Because like, you've shown keen interest and perseverance for about, what, four, five months by that time? And I said, yes, yes. That's something that I never really had in my mind. I just want to understand it from the outside. But if there's an opportunity, I think I want to get in and now do away with all of these bookish knowledge and actually practice it. So... Like I said, the journey until that, I think that was the main building block. Eventually, when the interviews happened, that was primarily like a one, two, three step process. And, and then there I was. Hey, awesome. And just to summarize for the folks who are willing to, uh, you know, get into product management through internal transitions, I think the first most important step is just learn about what product management is all about, right? Have that basic understanding it. Once you have that basic understanding, the second step is would be, you know, maybe shadowing someone, uh, talk to your uh, product managers in the organizations, uh, try spending some time with them, go with the meetings with them and see what's happening around the org, right? And then third and for, uh, most important thing is show your interest to your manager, right? Uh, until you share that this is what you're willing to do, I think, uh, you know, you can't take that next step. So I think this three steps would might help you, you know, to transition internally into product management role, uh, even if you're working into as an engineer, sales, marketing, whatever. So, it, so yeah, pretty Thank awesome, uh, Romel. Uh, thanks a lot again for sharing your journey. And let's deep dive into, you know, uh, the interview topics, you know, let us know uh, how the Gartner happened and how the recruiter reached out or you reached out to the recruiters and what were the various, uh, you know, uh, steps for that. Absolutely. So I, I take a leave from what I was just talking about in terms of what, what is the importance of having a mentorship network, right? What is the importance of lear learning from people who have already been there and done that? Uh, uh, I think I'll take you back a couple of months before I eventually got through uh, the offer for Gartner. 
I was in conversation with one of the product leaders at Gartner because Gartner for me as a as a product it was it was very new. It's a, as you would also be aware, it's a B two B product. So people like you and I as consumers, we may or may not really have used it, right? And it's primarily catering to a very niche uh, uh, segment of users: the CTOs, the CIOs, the C suits, and those kinds of leadership. Now, I really want to understand when we talk about product management at Gartner, what is it that we do, right? What are the different kinds of products that we build out? And that actually got me in connection with uh, one of the leaders uh, through LinkedIn. So we started conversations and I said, hey, are you interested in probably just sparing some time over the weekends? I would really love to understand uh, product journey and maybe even your product journey, right? So those conversations over a couple of months eventually helped me understand that, okay, this is what Gartner has to offer in product management. And I got really interested and I said, okay, now I, I really want to sort of get in and I want to tap into an opportunity. One of those conversations eventually, eventually led to uh, this, this product leader telling me that, uh, you know, there's this opportunity that is coming up, um, you know, as soon as the requisition is out, if you're interested, I can put in a referral. Now, here is where I wanted to sort of focus on the aspect where getting an opportunity through a referral is, is one of those, how do I say, jumpstart things that people should be doing. But it should also be used and not misused, as I've mentioned over here, right? Because a lot of people just would randomly reach out to probably strangers over LinkedIn and just ask them. The first question out of their uh, inbox would be, hey, would you be willing to refer? I'm not saying that there is anything wrong with that. Of course, translations have happened over there as well. But it's always nice to build that trust with the person who's referring you so that it is built for the long haul, right? So eventually, this person uh, was able to refer me. And that's how I actually landed that first call from the HR that we all sort of look forward to. When did they call us? We've been applying for so long. And that's, I think, how that first call uh, from the HR happened. And uh, I, I typically, this is something that I've been carrying with me since the time I have been engaged with product. Uh, something that I've also used in my product preparation, which is basically sell yourself, you know, before you try to sell your company or your product, because that's very important. Technically, if you're sitting for a product manager interview, they are also trying to assess how well you can sell yourself as a product. And that's something that I have incorporated, you know, from day one when I was, you know, when I started off with product management. So, and that's how things have been. Uh, uh, Sugat, any, anything that you want to double click into or should we just step into the timelines? No, then, absolutely. Let's keep step. proceeding. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So um, the, roughly, roughly, I can't really put, the exact numbers to it, but roughly everything happened from one stage to another through a span of one week, although specifically in my case, now this may not be true for a lot of scenarios, but I was already holding an offer with two other companies at the time. And I said, I really want to tap into Gartner. I don't want to let go of this. However, I am supposed or I'm expected to join this other company in like a month and a half time. So it can be expired a little bit. So that's the reason why what you see over here in terms of timelines are very ideal. Uh, but may not be the case always. So it started with an HR screening. Uh, we went on to round one with uh, my current boss. So basically the hiring manager for the role, uh, the senior director of the product. Then we went on to have uh, a round with the UX leadership, the UX side of uh, portfolio, and then the engineering side of leadership. And the last round was basically with the business unit head. So basically my boss's boss. So that's how the entire stacking was. And... Uh, I think we culminated in an offer being rolled out and we accepting the offer, but that's how roughly the timelines have been. So I think we'll just sort of go a little bit deeper into each of these aspects and what, what really happened behind the scenes. So uh, the reason why I wanted to also emphasize on HR screening, apart from the general understanding of HR screenings, which is basically, uh, I'm the HR, so you're the candidate. I give you a call, I'm like, hey, have you read the JD? Okay, what's your salary expectation and all those things. Those are general stuff that happen anyway. What I tried to incorporate a little bit was clarifying as much as there is an ambiguity in the JD with the HR or through the HR's help, get that clarification from the hiring manager. And I'll tell you why. One of the things that I was not too sure of through the JD was what is the exact product for which this role is being hired for? Is it an enterprise product or is it a customer or consumer facing product, right? Uh, or is it a data product? So there are many dimensions. So it did not really mention that. And a lot of times you come across JDs that are very generic in nature, right? Needs to know Scrum, needs to do product grooming, product backlog grooming, and everything. So I said, I have a question to you if you can clarify. What is the product? What is this product? 
right? Well, that this role will be supporting. And if it's there's an ambiguity, it's open for multiple roles. Just help me understand what these product lines are. Now, why that is important is that helped shape way for not just the next interview, but the interview after that as well. Because in terms of preparation, and I'll tell you how I got to that. So that's one of the things, one key call out that I would say at this stage, because clarifying any ambiguity at the HR screening round is very, very important because then you may not get that opportunity. You're directly in the fire, right? So that's how the HR screening happened. And then eventually the my profile sort of went through the hiring manager itself. There was some time that we eventually got with the hiring manager and that led us to round one. Now, between the HR screening and the, and the time that I got a clarity on the product until this round was the time when I was actively preparing on one artifact that I almost always use for, for any interviews, which is basically, and this, this might be a little bit more, a little bit different or sidestep from the typical way we prepare for interviews. It's it basically you prepare on your own experiences. You go into the interview, you share your experiences. And then if the interviewer is already prepared with questions, they will ask those questions or they tap into your experience. I wanted to navigate that a little bit, right? Because if this is the first time I'm going to be talking to someone from Gartner and, and in this case, my leader, it is imperative that I show them what value can I give them in tangible terms. I can speak about my experience. Hey, I did this, I did that, I led product teams, but how can it be relatable for them? And I started thinking that about that a little bit. And that's when I came with this procedure, I would say, which is I sit down, I create a one slider on the product for which this role is for. Now, in my case, uh, this role was going to lead one of the work streams under the broader Gartner.com portfolio, right? Uh, so I understood, okay, Gartner.com is going to be my product. I went into Gartner.com. I don't have my own account, right? So I went through a couple of YouTube videos, just try to understand the product as much as I could. Golden point here, if you're actually going to be interviewing for a consumer-facing product, because you can actually use it. Let's say you're interviewing with Swiggy. You just don't need to open up Swiggy and you can do that analysis. Now, what goes into that analysis? I try to see it from the lens of a product manager. Let's say today I do get this role. What are the first couple of things that I would want to change about that product? I listed it down in the typical fashion of a product backlog, right? I, I wrote down features. I wrote down a one-liner user story. And I prepared a like one slider just on this. Hey, if you have me on board, I will probably be working on this. Of course, in the able guidance of uh, the leadership. This one pager, when I took to this first round, uh, so that you won't believe it, it, the interviewer himself said, I think you've taken up a majority of the questions that I probably would have wanted to ask you. Why? Because that's what he wanted to assess me on, right? That's what he wanted to know. That uh, Do you have background enough to do this for us? I'm like, hey, not just the background. I'm giving you a backlog already before even joining the company, right? So that's a one pager that I created. And uh, questions are primary around that. A little bit to and fro on, you know, uh, okay, why do you think this? Okay, why do you think that? Why not this? Why not that? And in some shape or form, I saw that interview did have flavors of the typical product interview, right? Understanding how I do prioritization, understanding how you come across a scenario, but it was more tangible because I had something out there. It was more relatable. We were talking about actual product features uh, in that discussion. So that was basically round one um, with the leader. Any any so, questions, anything you want to double click? Yeah, Romil, thanks a lot actually for sharing this insight. So uh, just to be clear and even audience get it right, so this yeah. was not a case study round, right? The typical case study round yeah. or the take home assignment. This is something Romil yeah. prepared from his own side before appearing to the yeah. interview so that, you know, he have that upper edge on showing that, Hey, he can already act, act, start working as a product manager. So kudos Romil. I think this is an awesome interview tip. So even folks yeah. uh, who are appearing for similar interviews, always be prepared with some sort of, you know, analysis on the product, which you will be working so that. You know, uh, you don't have to wait for the take home assignment or case study to do such thing. Maybe just prepare something from your side and present it to the interviewers. And you never know that that can be a deal breaker or the deal maker for you. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because this actually came from the school of thought where I felt that the 30, 60, 90 plan, it's, it's something that we need to throw out of the window already because it's overused. Everyone knows about it. Sometimes me as an interviewer back in, back in Hitachi and Amex, right? I used to shrug whenever someone used to bring up 3690. I'm like, man, we know that. We've done that. We've seen a lot of that. Bring something new. And I think this definitely helps. I would definitely recommend this as a practice for everyone. Um, so that was round one. Now, along with that one pager for the, from a product perspective, 
because I had already anticipated that there's going to be UX round. What I also did was, and that brings us to round number two, also prepared a one slider, which is specific around UX, right? And, and you, you, if you think about it, you can actually sit in the seat of a user and be able to pinpoint, yeah, yeah, button, this button, why is there a button and then there's another button right next to it? Why are we not utilizing, taking away, you know, uh, precious UI real estate? Things like I was playing around with the functionality. There was a button that said uh, send PDF and then there was a button that said email. Essentially, they were doing the same function. And I said, I think we there is scope for improvement over here. So things like that, tool tips, right? You can do a whole world of things when you're seeing a product from the UX lens. I jotted those things down and then I had prepared another one pager, which I took to uh, this particular round, which I had with the UX side of leadership. And um, I did a little bit of extra leg of homework, which I will just get into. Uh, when we were discussing these aspects on the UX side, the UX uh, leader in this case also had inputs from his end. And he also wanted to go a little bit deeper into, okay, what has been my orientation in terms of UX? How do I typically interact with the UX teams? Because more often than not, product companies, they, they kind of are short staff in terms of their UX availability. And maybe, Sugat, you might have also experienced that in your past companies, right? It's not always one UX per scrum team. I wish that was an ideal case, but that's not the case. So it is important that in these conversations with UX leadership, you are showing how well you can collaborate with a shared resource. More often than not, that's what's going to happen for sure. So uh, I expressed how in my past I have had experiences where we had to sort of create like a design sprint just because the UX person is all over the place, right? So that's a proposal that I was able to put in in my previous company. So things like that was something that I was able to share. Now, one other aspect, it's always good to be aware of trends, as they say, technology trends, right? Product trends and all of those things. When you're having a conversation with someone on the UX side, and you have to understand this, they are very creative. So which means they are also very well abreast with what's happening in terms of trends on the UX side. The additional thing that I did was I also went through, you know, 2022's UX trend. So there, there are a couple of resources that you can see online. There are a couple of YouTube videos. And I just made myself aware of the fact that, okay, how is the world shifting its way in terms of understanding UX, right? Also, the psychology behind and the science behind UX per se. And I, I, I actually presented this point that, hey, you know what? I went through this. I wanted to understand what are your thoughts on that. And I kept it for the later part of the segment of the interview where I, you know, we as candidates can ask questions. And eventually that also went on to a beautiful conversation where we had to actually extend the interview by another half an hour because the conversation got so interesting for both parties, right? I was learning. They were understanding the fact that there is a keenness on UX from the candidate side. I think that was how the UX side of interview went. So here the one pager was like a good conversation starter or icebreaker, but eventually then the preparation towards UX was what I think helped me. And uh, all right. So I think with that, we step into the, the engineering leader round. And uh, I, I think it's going to be relatable for almost everyone who's sort of watching this for sure. So that you and I, uh, uh, is the fact that we step into the engineering round not really knowing how much of technology should I prepare. Like, um, I, I, there's even one part of all of our brains that says, do you need to code? Can you, do you want to just read up about a couple of code lines or something? We all go through that, right? And no matter how, tomorrow if I have to give an interview and it's with the engineering media, I still go through the same, same things in my head, right? Should I prepare? Should I be a little bit more aware of tech? So in line with that, what I did was I actually looked up the person's LinkedIn profile just to try to understand what are the different product portfolios that he has worked with, right? Now, did that necessarily help me? No. But did that help me understand where the person is coming from? Yes. And how that was incorporated into the conversation itself was, um, so the person clearly has good leadership in terms of uh, the, the engineering side, right? So I understood that, okay, leadership is probably something that I should be presenting more in this conversation. Now, I had a couple of examples in my product journey where I was associated uh, with, you know, being a part of a scrum where the scrum team, it, it was new, right? They were freshly out of college graduates, maybe one year of experience at their hand. And then the entire scrum team had an average of a year, year and a half worth of experience. Now, what is important when you're, when you're actually working with a scrum team that is that young is 
you know they are also learning scrum they are also learning a lot of things along with the fact that they have to also you know build and deploy code one of their core responsibilities so it is also important for you as the product owner product manager for that team to also enable them so there are a couple of examples that i had along those lines it eventually culminated in something called as the agility health radar so we had an assessment so this is a um i think it's a, a non profit group i'm not too sure uh so much like scrum alliance they give certifications on your team's agility uh, maturity so what they do is they come in to the organizing their third party companies they put you through a couple of questions a couple of tests a couple of um ice breaking sessions and eventually they give you a score right okay this scrum team so this scrum master product owner and then the entire development and qa team you guys are rated at this now back with amex one of the scrum teams i was associated with we actually were able to get a 97% you know on 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 that particular agility head rate which was the highest across the portfolio i brought that up as a talking point because that also proves the fact that me as a product owner in the setup of a scrum there's an external entity who's also validating the fact that hey you know what i think we guys would want to rate you at this scale so that eventually also then paved the way to the conversation that we went into difficult scenarios those are the typical scenarios that you come across right you have a last moment prioritization we have a release going on on friday today we are sitting on a wednesday what will you do so those are questions that i would recommend that you sort of prepare based off of your examples and not really going by what is the best answer to give in that situation because your answers are going to be more true to to what you did versus what is the general well received answer at that stage so i think that was how the engineering um round was and uh i think lastly uh, the round with the business unit leader which in this case was the vp for product now here the conversation more often than not it's going to be very very free flow right one of i think two ways it will go is either when you're doing your introduction right they would want to just double click into a little bit but in a very casual format right because they still they're still assessing you and it's an actual round that happens but it's more light hearted on the fact that how are you as a candidate holistically they put you through a product round they put you through an ux round engineering round now they want to understand okay now let's put all of these pieces together and let's just have a general conversation so i think there were there were not a lot, lot of questions that i can actually share from this conversation because it's more conversation driven like um i actually got an opportunity to ask uh, this leader a couple of questions so i actually did have a couple of questions on how are decisions taken in this in this company or specifically in your organization you do a lot of data driven decision making now every time those questions were asked it was it was imperative for me because at the end of the day it's an interview right for me also to sort of provide or exhibit value and how i did that was while i was understanding how it's done at gartner i was also presenting how i have seen it happen and how i was also an agent to those changes in in my experience so it went both ways the person is not only sort of providing value to you by answering your question but you're also providing value to them by increasing their confidence in your candidature so i think the business unit leader round uh, i mean that was how it went i think 40 minutes roughly 30 to 40 minutes is how long uh, they go and uh, i think that's pretty much it um, you know that brings us to the end of the line i think one week after this round we had a conversation on the on on uh, the good news and the offer being rolled out and that eventually led me to join them so that's been my journey congratulations so yeah congratulations so mel on you know cracking this interview and and being part of gartner today uh you know yeah. uh, i really enjoyed the conversation which and especially the way you were telling it couple of great learnings for me as well right how you can be proactive uh, and and yeah. you know take those steps and uh, be ready for the interviews and not wait for them give a uh, take home assignment or, uh, or yeah. discuss about their product right so that was a major learning yeah. for me and I, i think viewers would also enjoy this right uh one thing before we wind up right i'm very curious to know uh, you mentioned about couple of times about the product and the role that you will be working on uh, can you right. help us understand right what does that product looks like uh, uh, which you will be working around and typically you know when we talk about gartner we know uh, uh, can you also share what gartner is for the viewers who are not sure or what are the different product portfolios they have Okay, all right. So I think in one word, Gartner is your trusted consultant. Whenever you wanna uh, get your hands on great research out there, like like market cutting edge 
research. Uh, Gartner is your go-to when you want to just do like an assessment in terms of, okay, I have this problem that I need to solve for this year for my company. How do I do it, right? And Gartner is your go-to to basically find answers to years and years of research that uh, our research analysts or associates, as we call them, they have put their blood, sweat, and tears into, right? There's a lot of vested knowledge that Gartner has on varying subjects. And what Gartner as a portfolio, as a product does is uh, for a subscription, it will give you as a user access to all of this and much more. If you want a dedicated consultant uh, to sort of spend some time with you and then understand your the business case or problem solving that you're doing for your company, they will do that, right? It gives you access to world-class conferences, right? Uh, where you can actually attend uh, seminars, webinars, conferences, which are actually hosted and led by world leaders in a particular niche like AI, uh, cybersecurity, uh, data, all of those things. So that's what Gartner does as a, as a product. Now, the specific product portfolio that I'm going to be associated with is the Gartner.com portfolio. So basically the, the experience that you, let's just look at as a user, when you log in onto Gartner, everything is going to be a product of, of my product team, the product team I'm associated with. I'm going to be specifically looking at how we can get more engagement and retention out of it. So I think every product manager has their own, uh, you know, transitions, right? So I feel that I'm now going to be identifying myself as a, as an engagement uh, product manager. So I was doing a lot of growth product management. I think so far it was a good transition for me. So I think that's the product portfolio that we have. Uh, and uh, that's pretty much what Gartner is about. Thanks, Romil. And that was quite insightful. You know, we got some more clarity on what's going to be a role and what Gartner is all about for the viewers. So, yeah, and we are towards the end of the episode. Uh, before we wind up, Romil, do you want to have any anything you want to share to the wide audience uh, who are watching this right now? Um, I think, um, first of all, like, share, subscribe to, to this <laughs> channel because personally, yeah. like I said, you know, I... I you won't believe it. I, I think I come to your content sometimes when I'm I, I'm just, I don't know, sitting down for lunch and I just want to watch something that is informative as well. I'm drawing something out of it. I want to probably typically go to Netflix or, or Prime, right? I want to just watch something uh, that is more knowledge rich. So so I think that's one note to everyone who's watching this, right? Um, and any amount of support for this channel still doesn't cut the kind of value that we are drawing out of it. And uh, I think uh, as a closing note, the majority of the flavor of all of my preparations towards interviews and conversations in the interviews have primarily been around the value of, as I've always said, you know, value of mentorship, right? It's, it's always like, and it doesn't even have to be a leader of someone who's actually functioning at two or three levels above you. I can actually look to Sugat for mentorship on the fact that, Hey, how do you do podcasts, man? How do you do video editing? Something as, as, as niche as that. You can look to me and there's, there's anything, Padani, I don't know if you see something of value from my end, but you can be like, hey man, I want to learn this from you. So it is always important because you are always learning from the people around you, right? Knowledge is, is that's how it's shared. And eventually let that, let that be that seed that you plant, wait for it to grow. And when it does grow, in my case, it translated as a referral, right? Without me having to push someone, the person himself said, I would want to refer you. Are you interested in coming on board? So I think part of mentorship, part of networking and doing all of that from a self-growth perspective, not from just from the perspective where I want to be known by X number of people. I want to just grow my network. I want to have X followers. That's good, but that's not great. And I think between good to great is this journey that all of us are on. So that's, that's I think, all. Java Jan me Well said, Romil. Uh, and I hope people did will actually eventually like this video and the amount of insights that you have shared for and yeah if if uh, you know you folks do find out any openings at gartner do follow the tips to you know get yourself uh, converted into a gartner product manager so thank you romail uh, so much again for being part of this uh, video and the channel and we wish you all the very best for all the upcoming challenges and milestones at gartner Thank, thank you so you. much. Likewise to you, brother. All right. Thank you.